We've been full-time travelers for the last eight months, and during that time, we've stayed in 15 hotels and 13 Airbnbs. We think that's enough time for us to give you our opinions both. Welcome back to Finding Gina Marie, where we share our lives as full-time travelers and the connections we make along the way. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Judy. And I'm Kevin. Before we started traveling full-time, we never even considered using Airbnbs whenever we took a vacation or needed to find accommodations. Our vacations were always shorter and we didn't feel like there was any advantage to having that ick factor of kind of being in someone's home. Not that we knew anything about Airbnbs. I think the concept of staying in someone's place, we just didn't know enough about it. And hotels were just familiar. You know, we've been doing those for years. Exactly. And I don't think we understood what was involved about checking in or where they might be located. It just was too many unknown factors. Yeah. So it was just easier to book a hotel and be done with it. But since we have this experience of staying in 13 Airbnbs now over the past eight months, what's changed? Well, Obviously, we've figured out how Airbnbs work. We'll walk you through what our experiences have been with both hotels and Airbnbs and let you know what our obstacles are, pricing, and overall pricing at the end. We'll give you a blow by blow so you know what to expect. And we'll give you our recommendation at the end too. So let's start off and talk about the first topic, which is location. As far as location goes, what have our experiences been when we're trying to find hotels versus trying to find Airbnbs. What have you found? Hotels often are in a hotel area and sometimes they're isolated and they're not really by anything. There's just a hotel in the wilderness <laughs> and uh, they're usually occupied by vacationers or business travelers. They're not always going to be in the heart of a city. Sometimes they are, but it's not always a guarantee. And if they're in the heart of the city, sometimes that is the tourist area of the city, which is not what we wanted to do when we're not on vacation. You know, this is this is supposed to be full time travel, our new life, living in a home wherever we are. And that seemed like just the opposite. You know, you're going to stay in a hotel and it's going to be surrounded by hard rock cafes and McDonald's. It's not what we're doing. My idea that Airbnbs weren't going to be in the center of town actually has proven very false. Uh, they're going to be uh, wherever people are. And sometimes that does mean that you are going to be across from the Duomo in Florence and um, in the center of even Old Town. And sometimes they're going to be in really rural areas like we had in outside of Cairo and Giza, where we didn't expect to be on these dirt roads and these back alleyways but you know that was where the airbnb was and created this unique experience for us to learn about a new location right because airbnbs basically are going to always be where the locals live so one advantage is that you're going to be near grocery stores and uh, restaurants and very local places and hopefully quick and easy places to get like we've really enjoyed having a mini mart or something near us so we can quickly run out of our apartment, go grab little essentials and bring it back without having to go to, you know, a different part of town or something. And that's because, you know, we try to stay in these real areas. Let's talk about cancellations. What is our experience with cancellations on both Airbnbs and hotels? So we do have a hotel that didn't allow us to cancel. Of course, when we booked it, it was clear that there were no cancellations at the time. I didn't think I'd need to, but even though I had booked through a third party and had a, a high loyalty level, uh, I couldn't get around it. So we paid $136 or something for a hotel that, that we didn't stay in. And conversely, the same thing could happen with an Airbnb, but you typically will have choices the same as hotels. You've always been really good about cancellation policy. Sometimes our travel plans change. And Airbnbs, when you try to book those, you typically try to get one that lets you have a long period of time before you have to commit to it. Some hotels do allow last minute cancellations, but you have to pay extra for that in most situations. And Airbnbs are kind of the same. We've typically chosen to stay at Airbnbs that have a longer window for cancellations. There have been a few that only have 48 hours after you book. 
those aren't ideal. <laughs> but if we are imminently staying, we're not so concerned. For ones that we book that are several months out, we try to book ones that will allow you to cancel closer to the time when you're going to be staying there. Right, because we don't have control over everything that happens in our travel. This is full-time travel, and sometimes things come up. Right, and in both, you can pay extra to have travel insurance that allows illness or overriding circumstances to get out of your stay. Yeah, but again, we're not trying to pay extra for things if we can possibly help it. Is the concern that an Airbnb will cancel on you? Well, Airbnbs come a long way and they've heard people's problems and concerns and they've really tried to address them. There currently are fees and penalties and consequences that hosts have to pay if they cancel on guests at the last minute. So they're really disincentivized to cancel without a really, really good reason. And, and what you do is you're, you're doing your due diligence. You're checking on what the host's reputation is, just like you would check on hotels, what's their rating and everything like that. Right, and a host that cancels too often can be removed from the platform. One thing that I would point out is you wanna be very mindful that you don't let a host convince you to cancel, which relieves them of some of the obligations that they have. So um, if they give you some sob story, don't allow that. Make them cancel if they're trying to get out of the stay. Yeah, now we haven't had bad experiences. So we're, we're in that, maybe it's a, the sweet eight month period where we really haven't had problems, but so far so good. Right, we've not had any hosts cancel on us. And when we've needed to change or modify our dates, which we have had to do, they've been very, very accommodating. So that's been awesome. So cancellations is a thumbs up basically for Airbnbs. They've been really good for us so far. We'd like to hear about what you have experienced with in the comments below, because you have something different, we'd like to hear about it. So obviously we're booking Airbnb through airbnb.com. Let's talk about loyalty programs that you use for making sure that we can get hotels for a good price. I originally used hotels.com all the time. And that was because for every 10 nights that you stayed at a hotel, you accumulated a free night. And we had enough status that we also got perks like um, a bottle of wine or an upgraded room. So definitely Cookie sometimes. <laughs> Definitely reasons to stay someplace, uh, and, and it didn't matter. You didn't have to stay at any particular brand. You just needed to stay at any Hotels.com place. But they recently switched over to one key, and things have changed quite a bit. So you still earn dollars, but I think at a third or a quarter of the value as they that they used to be. And to me, that's been a huge drawback. Yeah, it's not the same as getting free nights. I mean, we we'll talk about this in the cost, but we've lowered our cost because of the free nights you've used at Hotels.com. And people say, well, why don't you use a hotel loyalty program for a particular chain of hotels? Honestly, where we travel around the world, you can't always rely on picking up a certain hotel line, right? Well, and even if you can, I don't know, I do have a loyalty program with Marriott, but Marriott's tend to be expensive. They tend to be, let's say, like a McDonald's or a Starbucks. When I am traveling somewhere, I want to have the experience of that particular country or city. I'm not necessarily looking to have it be um, the chains, the big chains. Right. Boutique hotels are our favorite because they do give us more of that, wow, what's special about this place? Not you wake up in a room and go, it could be Miami. I have no idea. The plus side of that is that there are times when you will be upgraded and, you know, is always a bonus when you get a nicer room or a suite. Obviously, that's not going to happen with Airbnb. You're booking with a specific host for a specific space. There's no chance of any big bonuses. But sometimes they will put amenities like um, a snack or uh, ref things in your refrigerator to kind of create a warmer welcome for you. And that's a nice perk. True. We've had some really good experiences. We'll get into the detail of pricing near the end of this video, but in general, what is our experience with price? You can stay in really budget hotels or you can stay at really luxury places, but regardless, you're not going to get any kind of discount for staying a week or two weeks. But this is where Airbnbs really shine. 
they do offer discounts if you stay at least a week. And in fact, they offer really big breaks if you stay an entire month. Yeah. And as full-time travelers, we really like to stay a month in a place that allows us to settle in. So uh, that month is a sweet spot for us, especially on price, but also on comfort. Yeah, it fits in with our travel plans. It fits in the, the way we like to get to know an area. Right, and I can't remember where we were recently, but it turned out that if we stayed 27 days, it cost as much as if we stayed 30. So why wouldn't we stay 30 days? Oh, in the Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a sweet spot. It was it was a great deal. So of course we're gonna take advantage of that. Now when we say boutique hotels, we're not talking about big luxury hotels. We're trying to book the hotels that actually have some breaks or when you were getting the days off that would actually accept the, the free nights at uh, hotels.com. The Airbnbs that we are staying in are not grand, super fancy, you know, million dollar homes. <laughs> but at the same time, they're average homes that we are comfortable staying in. And we are spending an average of about $30 to $50 a night. And we have the whole house or apartment to ourselves. So there is no hotel that we could stay at that would be as comfortable at that price point. True. And as private or have as many amenities as we get at Airbnbs, which we'll talk about the accommodations next. Right, and that aren't in a super seedy, unsafe part of town either. <laughs> True. <laughs> Airbnbs tend to get a bad rap for some of the, the hidden things that come up, like extra fees or the requirements you have to do before you leave a Airbnb or how it has to be cleaned or whatever else they've tagged to it. What was your experience? I know you found a couple tricks. Sure. So the first thing is there's now a toggle that allows you to include all fees when you're looking at the places to stay. So right out of the gate, um, it's going to reduce the number of homes in your price range. So uh, that's like super easy to do. And it leaves you with less, one less unknown. Right. Yeah. You're not going to get surprised at the end when it's a $43 uh, Airbnb, yeah. but then it ends up costing, you know, $80 a night because there's a $200 cleaning fee and extra charges. Airbnbs also have house rules, and we look at those very carefully to see what the expectations are upon checkout. Uh, so we've never booked any place that has required us to do any laundry or do any specific cleaning or anything else. Sure, there are some Airbnb hosts that require those things, but we just choose not to book with them. And that's been great. We haven't had anyone who's really asked us to do anything. Again, it comes back to do your homework up front, do your due diligence to make sure you know exactly what's going on because... I mean, I don't look at them much. You, you show me the Airbnbs. You do all the heavy lifting and all the hard work. I just look at them and go, yep, yeah, that space looks good. We have seating. We Good, good, good. Yeah, great job, Jude. You know. We typically will clean up after ourselves. We'll do all of our dishes. We'll make sure that the counters are oh, yeah. clean. The, the basic things that we would do uh, just to leave someplace, but it's helpful knowing that you don't have to. Uh, go through the trouble as though this was your house that you had to maintain up until the very moment you were trying to leave. Because we typically uh, leave early in the morning for a hotel or a flight, and we don't have time to do laundry beforehand. <laughs> for sure. Because of the way we travel, the accommodations are really important to us. What they offer us, especially since we do a lot of work in our apartment, we do cooking, we do cleaning of our clothes, we record videos, we actually edit videos. So we spend a lot of time in it. There's things we need to have when we book a place. So what are some of the accommodation issues that you've come up with when working with hotels and Airbnbs? So as I just mentioned, we typically are always requesting to have the entire Airbnb to ourselves. You certainly can book just a room, but because we spend so much time there, that's not really practical for us. And because we spend so much time uh, not just in our space, but also like we're there for a month at a time. We want to spread out. We don't want to stare at the four walls. So hotels that will really just give us a bed and a TV and, you know, sometimes a desk with a uh, chair, but that's facing the wall. It's not really conducive to having meals on a regular basis. At a, at a desk and there's not even always two chairs. So, <laughs> so one of us. <laughs> Someone's sitting on the bed. 
<laughs> well, and, and of course, the kitchens in most hotels aren't conducive to making bigger meals. Therefore, heating stuff up, maybe a microwave, maybe a hot plate, where you often save money by doing meals and, and bigger cooking when we can. Right. So you can specifically request an Airbnb that has a kitchen. And I also look for the ones that, and it states this, it's one of the amenities that they list, that there are all of the ingredients or basic ingredients that you would need. We go into a, an Airbnb and we go through this checklist, you know, make sure that we've gotten what we expected out of it. You know, the pictures are sometimes make rooms look really big and sometimes they're a little bit smaller with the wide angle lens. Uh, also the, the kitchen, we go through where are the plates, where are the cups, where are the cookware, uh, what spices do they have? What are we gonna have to run out and grab? Do they have olive oil? Because the Italian here does cook some olive oil based <laughs> meals. And you know, there is that kind of that settling in, which in a hotel, you basically walk in, you say, okay, we're going to be here. Here's what they have. We're only going to be here for two nights or one night. So it really doesn't matter that much. One of the nice things about an Airbnb kitchen is that you will also often get an actual oven and things like a toaster as well, which you don't always find in the kitchenettes of a hotel. And for us, uh, I'm always looking for a Wi-Fi and for a washing machine so that we can wash clothes. Again, we are typically staying in Airbnbs for a week or more. And so having clean clothes before we leave is important. Yeah, we don't look for a dryer because most places in Europe don't offer a dryer. It's expensive for them to run that. And we don't mind either because most of the places uh, the drying racks are fine, you know, our clothes dry fast enough. It's nice that Airbnbs will list all of the amenities, so you shouldn't have any surprises. And if they don't have something that they said they would, you can request the host provide it. Yeah. We've not had any problems with that. No, the, the only problem we've had is with Wi-Fi because it's all relative to people. The Wi-Fi is fast. Well, not when you're trying to upload YouTube videos. You could stay in a suite in a hotel and then you have a little bit more room but that's going to be definitely more expensive than what an Airbnb would typically cost. So assuming that you are in a regular standard sized hotel room, you're not typically going to get a couch or um, a table and chairs to have uh, food. Those are things that are nice perks for us, especially since uh, we don't really like to have to work on from our bed. So it's nice to be able to have a table and chairs to work at or, you know, kind of going between spaces, kind of like you do in your own home. Yeah, where you don't want to be in the same seat in the same place all the time for a whole month. Having a couch is kind of nice. And hopefully the couch is sturdy and comfortable enough that you don't mind. I don't mind working on my lap. I have no problem with the computer on my lap. But if the couch is uncomfortable or if there isn't a couch, now you're back to sit in the bed or whatever else is limited. Right. And that is true. Sometimes you can't tell how comfortable something is based on just reviews or the, the fact that you see that there's a picture. Yeah. Especially if the picture is when the thing was new and now it's a few years older and it doesn't look quite the same. Some Airbnbs will specifically say that they don't have carbon monoxide detectors or smoke detectors. Don't let that deter you necessarily though, because you can buy portable travel plug-in carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. And that's easy to just throw into your bag so you have them with you. There's a link in the description below that you can use. One of the advantages of Airbnbs is sometimes there's pretty cool perks and uh, things that are just in the home that you wouldn't normally get in a hotel. Like when we were in Torino, there was an actual piano in the Airbnb and, and we walked in, I looked over and here's an upright piano. I was been dying to play keyboard piano. So this was like, Woo! What a great job. Thanks, dude. <laughs> well, and we've also had balconies that would allow you to have coffee outside or rooftops. And one of the other perks was that we were in Scotland and we had free bikes to ride. Oh, cool. uh, the host had provided them for us. So that was cool. Yeah, they were just in the garage in the back. Really nice. And there are unconventional accommodations too that you can book like tree houses and houseboats and you know, these small houses that people get. So if you're into something that's different like that, you know, it's you can worth. find them on Airbnb. Yeah. Sometimes regardless of what you're paying at a hotel, unless you're spending a lot of money, uh, especially in Europe, uh, I know the UK and Paris where we've stayed, 
we've spent quite a lot of money for still getting a very small amount of space. Oh, right. So <laughs> sometimes boutique means a boutique. <laughs> One of the things that we like about hotels is they're predictable. You can just walk up to the front desk and you can get into your room. And Airbnbs are not always so straightforward. That's true. Uh, sometimes they have lock boxes, which is really convenient because it doesn't matter what time of day we get there. We don't have to coordinate with a host. Other times you actually have a host show up at the Airbnb or a host assistant, whoever's there and locally and they can walk you through, show you where things are, uh, tell you how to control the climate, everything else that's in the Airbnb. Well, we've also had some interesting conversations with our hosts True. when we've gone through the check-in check process. So that's not always a bad thing when a host chooses to meet you. Yeah, like the piano place in Torino, he actually gave us some good information about the area, some of the best restaurants. Oh, you need to go stop here if you like coffee. Those kind of things are so important, especially when we're new in a city. Getting out there for the first time is tricky, and if your host can give you those quick tips, man, that's wonderful. One big benefit of a hotel is if you arrive early or you need to stay after a checkout, there's usually some room where they will allow you to store your luggage yeah. until it's time to depart or if you get there early so that you can sightsee without schlepping your luggage along. And sometimes our trip out of a city is later in the day. So if we don't have a place to store our stuff, we're rolling suitcases around with us. Small ones, but still suitcases as we get ready for our departure. And sometimes it means that we're hanging around a coffee shop for a little bit of time, but... Oh darn. <laughs> More coffee. <laughs> it's not always a problem. <laughs> as you see with every intro to our videos, connections are really important to us. And sometimes staying in an Airbnb means we actually get to make more connections. Yeah, exactly. In fact, when we were in Broadway Ferry, the host had stopped by on a couple of occasions and it was fine. It We've never had a host just drop in unexpectedly. No. So um, I guess I want to just reassure you of that. <laughs> but um, there were a couple of things that we needed, nothing big, but he dropped off a book for us when he knew that Kevin was interested in whiskey and that was just a nice surprise. And he dropped um, off an air purifier in case we, because we said this smelled funny like smoke and he said, I think it's from the backyard, but he brought over an air purifier just in case, you know, in case that smell was bad for us. Right. Yeah. So he was really proactive. He was, he was great. And when we were in Giza, our host offered to bring us dinner one night, yeah. and uh, that was koshri. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. It was amazing. It was our first experience, and it was delicious. And she also warned us first and came by with desserts. And she had also left fruit for us when we arrived. So those were just really sweet perks and it was nice to talk with her about some of that stuff as well it was and even the security guard at that spot he took care of us he he made sure we knew because uh, you couldn't wash laundry in that actual airbnb but they had a local uh, place that would do your laundry and he would grab our laundry bags take them for us bring them back always kind of sneak in some here's some fruit too you're not eating enough fruit you know just really kind and like by the time we're done with that visit we really kind of connected with him. And even though we didn't speak the same language, we felt like we had a bond there. Exactly. And, and we also now have connections with all of our hosts in terms of some person who lives in a city or country that we've visited. If we want to go back, we will be dealing with those same people. Now, granted, we're at the mercy of their Airbnb being available again, but if not, we can always reach out to them directly. You can message a host without actually booking with them first and seeing um, if they can make re recommendations for yeah. anything. So I think that you know, we're building friendships along the way. Yeah, essential and important the way we want to travel. As far as getting help or assistance through Airbnb or through your Airbnb host, uh, let's talk about the problems that you might have or that we've had in our stays. When we were in Giza, we did have a problem with Wi-Fi and we paid a little bit extra, but we asked our host if she could increase our Wi-Fi. Well, we had, ran out of data, so. We said, what would it cost us to have it boost so we could have more data? And she said, oh, it's, it's, it's going to be 100 Egyptian pounds. Like, fine, that's, <laughs> was that like six bucks? I don't care. <laughs> yes, 
do it. We'll, <laughs> we'll gladly pay that for you. And she was very quick with that. We also had a situation in Leche where we didn't have hot water working properly, which you could have in a hotel as well. Oh, yeah. You know, um, now granted in an Airbnb, they have no place necessarily to shift you to but they had a key and they arranged to have someone come and take a look at the water we could have been in the property at the time but we chose not to be and that worked out fine but if there were ever a problem with the host or you got there and you thought oh there's no way i could stay in this place the airbnb portal is designed to give you some assistance and i think that things have definitely improved from how it used to be that as they've matured they're a lot more responsive to some of the issues that you're having and they do function as an intermediary yeah i think government regulations and things have also pushed on them to step up their game and so we've had a good experience with them so far. Right, I think that it's important that you notify the portal as soon as you're having a significant problem. They will always try in general to have you work things out with the host, but don't wait until the end of your stay. You know, you've been there three weeks <laughs> and then you report a problem that has been existing all that time. There is a limit to what they're able to help with. I think that there's maybe a 72 hour window um, but again, you know, that will probably evolve and change. We have not had any significant problems like that. So I feel very good that you've picked some great places and talked to some uh, excellent hosts. If you talk to the host ahead of time, you're probably going to know how they respond to things. If they're quick to respond early in the interview process. Right. That's a, that's a really good point is sometimes it really benefits you to deal with hosts that are responsive. And there's a place on the portal that will show this host typically responds in X amount of time. And you can test that for yourself before you even book a stay and just ask um, a question or two, like what are your Wi-Fi speeds? Or can you give recommendations of what's nearby? Or, whatever you feel like asking and just test to see how responsive they've been. And we've had a couple of hosts, I think it was probably Ferry, where we had to arrive a day late or a day early and we kept shifting it around. He was very nice about that. And we've had a couple of times where we've had to leave a day early. And I think we've gotten a, a refund for days. Right. Yeah. Which has been, we didn't ask for it. We didn't expect it. It was our fault that our schedule changed and they've just been very nice about it. Yeah. That was a CC. Oh, great. Yeah. But in a hotel, you can go directly to the front desk and you can speak to someone, uh, you know, eyeball to eyeball. And it's a little bit harder for somebody to evade you because truly in Airbnbs, the host may not even be living in that same town. They may be in another country. Oh, like Luxor. Our local person that was helping us out was not the Airbnb owner. She was in London or someplace, and he was our local connection. But you're still at the mercy of the a manager or a corporate headquarters to do something. And hotels don't always have another room for you. So if your room is in bad shape, they may say, sorry, we don't have any other rooms, and you just have to put up with it. I will say that if you want to avoid as many problems as possible, you will really pay very close attention to the pictures that you're seeing, um on on the website and you'll also be reading all of the reviews so if someone raises a concern don't automatically be dismissive of it you really want to pay attention to what that feedback is and ping the host you know get an answer from the host so let's talk a little bit about a thorny topic which is the politics of airbnb airbnb has felt like a, an invasive uh, company in some areas of the world because they're buying up a lot of properties that maybe are in need of the locals. Let's say Portugal. I've heard concerns about some of the cities in Portugal where Airbnb is taking up so many places that now the price of rent has gone up for locals. Right. Or, yeah, in such a way that it makes it difficult for someone making a lot less money than a foreigner traveling on vacation to be able to afford to live there. So they're priced out of uh, some local areas. Um, unfortunately, what are our options instead of Airbnb at this point? As much as I'd like to say, let's just do something else. We've just talked about it. Hotels are expensive. Hotels aren't in the right parts of town. All the negatives of hotels 
Even if they are in the right parts of town, you're not getting necessarily the same local experience. Having like a bedroom and a living room, and even if it's a studio apartment, it still feels like you're living the lifestyle that a local is living. And yeah, because of tour, on tours, we told tour guides, oh, you're coming right past our apartment right now. Oh, you're living here. That's a great spot to, to live in town. Check out this, 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 and this, which they rarely do if you're staying in a hotel. They're like, oh yeah, that's nice. <laughs> you know, when we are on the road full time and there's no home to go home to, we want our Airbnbs to feel as close to what it would feel like if we lived in a city full time, because that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So even though the politics of Airbnb are still a little bit sketchy, we haven't come up with a better solution. So for now, Airbnb is going to be our solution. Right. I do think that it's a similar situation with Uber and Lyft versus local taxi services. Right. Um, you know, you have to choose the lesser of the evils. And I do like to think that there are certain things in place that are rules to counter some of the issues. Yeah. And I think we do need to pay attention to that as we go forward because we don't have any plan to stop traveling anytime soon. So we're going to have to use the facilities that are available to us. And right now, that's Airbnb. We need to be good citizens of it. Well, I think we're somewhat between a rock and a hard place with some of this. I do think that when we stay during longer periods of time and or even just a week, you know, when we're buying groceries, we are directly impacting the communities that we're staying in. So we are putting money into uh, neighborhoods and we're not just frequenting uh, expensive tourist yeah. restaurants and that kind of thing. So we're hoping that we're doing some small off offset. Maybe we're kidding ourselves. I know that this is a really thorny topic and people have a lot of really strong opinions about it. For us, we could not do what we're doing. I mean, we really just couldn't yeah. if we had to stay in hotels full time. Yeah. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We'd love to hear from you and any ideas you have. But I think that's a valid point that we're supporting the local economy and we do that for weeks at a time, which I don't think that's insignificant. So as promised, let's talk about the costs of staying in Airbnbs versus hotels and some of the reasons why we do one or the other. Right. Let's get into specifics here. So up until now, we've differentiated based on the length of our stay. For instance, we'll stay in a hotel when we're only going to be someplace one or two days. And that's typically because we need to get to a major city in order to catch a flight or a train somewhere. So it was just easier in Brody Ferry to stay overnight in Edinburgh and actually enjoy some of Edinburgh's wonderful accommodations and then fly out the next day because it was an early morning flight. We've also had experiences where things got canceled, like we lost a flight uh, coming out of Cairo. So we had to book a hotel. In fact, we couldn't even stay in the hotel we had planned to stay in to catch the flight out of there. So we ended up having to book two hotels in two nights. We also stay in hotels when we have loyalty points to use or free night. In Rome, we actually had to go there and stay overnight for some vaccinations. And you use loyalty points for that from Hotels.com, which turned out to be a very inexpensive stay. In fact, we even got snacks that day. Yeah. that trip so that was a bonus that was one of those boutique hotels that we we kind of got into and we went even though our airbnb was nice we sat in the hotel going ah oh, snacks and oh wine and this is really great why don't we stay in hotels more this is a beautiful place <laughs> wouldn't have been as cheap the next night we only had like one night to get the discount so the breakdown is we've been in Airbnbs for 217 days and we've been in hotels for 17 days over the last eight months. How much have we spent per like an average for each of those nights? The cost per night for Airbnbs is $56.90 where hotels are $103.72. A lot of that would be more expensive if you hadn't used all your tricks of the trade with the hotels.com. So for Airbnbs, what's our most expensive cost per night and our least expensive? This surprised me when we looked at the numbers because I knew that when we spent 30 days in Brody Ferry, 
that was the most expensive that we'd spent for an entire month. And that was a little bit more than $1,600. But the nightly price for that Airbnb was only $53.81. So it really wasn't expensive as I thought. Compared to we were only in Genoa for a week and that was $92.95 for per night for seven days. So, so that's so, why the longer stays in Airbnbs really help us. Yeah, exactly. The cheapest Airbnb that we were at was $22.18 in Luxor. Now we weren't there for a full month, but Egypt is very inexpensive. So you can imagine how much cheaper it would have been if we would have been there a month. Yeah, we, <laughs> they would have been paying us to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But that stay was so inexpensive. We actually kept that Airbnb while we went on the Nile River cruise, which we have a video about. You can check that out. And because, why give it up? You know, that, that cost per night, yeah, we'll go on the cruise, we'll come back, we'll be able to leave our luggage in our Airbnb. It worked out really great. So why don't you talk about what our costs were for hotels? So hotels are very dependent on what we've gotten discounts on and the, the nights we stay. It doesn't matter about the time so much as, as what you've gotten as far as discounts. We got that discount in Rome at that little boutique hotel. So we basically only spent $16 for that night stay. And that was amazing. And then, in contrast, we've paid the cheapest amount in Egypt to stay at an Airbnb, but the most to stay at a hotel because we had very little option. We got stuck there. We had to pay one night somewhere else. We wanted to stay close to the airport. So Le Passage was $208.55 for that one night, which really kind of locked us in. We had no choice on that. And because we needed to stay somewhere near the airport, we didn't have a lot of negotiating power. Yeah. and. The hotel we had been in was sold out for that night so that also meant that there weren't any discounts to be had in that area yeah, we really wanted to stay at the same hotel they said sorry you can't so doing this video has given us an opportunity to think through our last eight months of travel and really come to some conclusions about you know how we've experienced this travel and, and what we've paid and all the rest so what do you think about our experiences overall some of this was eye-opening for me for instance as we were saying, we typically stay in hotels when we only are one night somewhere. But I'm seeing that we really could stay in Airbnbs for just a night and save a lot more money than what we're doing because some of these hotels are really expensive and I've used up a lot of my credits. There's with this transition with hotels.com, there's not a lot of additional savings that we have uh, and we use booking.com occasionally, yeah. but their perks are different and they don't have some of the same loyalty benefits. Now, the problem with that would be if we're actually trying to stay somewhere close to an airport or a train station just so we can transition quickly during our travel days, it might be trickier to find the Airbnb open for that day near that location. Sure, but I don't think it's impossible. It just means that I may look there first before automatically looking at um, hotels.com. That's interesting. I, I think that would be kind of exciting to try that out. And the benefit of that is that some of the amenities that we look for, we don't necessarily need. Sure. So we don't need to have a kitchen. Like more choice in Airbnbs if we do the one night, two night stays. Exactly. Okay. So for the way we travel, I think that we are still all in on Airbnbs whenever we can. I don't think that there's really any desire for us to change and do things differently. I can't think of anything, but maybe you have some thoughts. Let us know in the comments if you have things that we didn't hit, some topics we didn't talk about. We'd like to hear about that from you. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a like. We'd also like you to join our community if you haven't already, and you can do that just by subscribing. And check out FindingGinaMarie.com. Our website has a lot of information and Judy's journal. Lots of good articles about what we're doing on the road. Until next time. Until next time.